Good evening and welcome. My name is Nick Bonner for TreeStuff.com. We've got a great webinar planned for you tonight. We've got the Mojé team here in Indianapolis. Jim Rollins is going to walk us through how to inject trees with Mojé micro injectables, some of the common pests that are out there today, and some of the things that we can do to help manage them in our urban forests. Uh, as always, I want to thank the ISA for providing CEUs, continuing education units, for these and other webinars that we provide. There will be a quiz available at the end of this broadcast. The link will be posted in the comments of this broadcast and on a separate page on our Facebook. Uh, it takes the ISA, you know, two to three months to get CEUs processed sometimes, so please be patient. We will turn those in about a week afterwards. Uh, you need 16 out of 20 to pass the test. We've got some other exciting announcements coming up at the end of this broadcast. We're going to be doing something in a couple of weeks uh, that we've never done before. Uh, it should be really fun. Uh, but it will be kind of a fleeting opportunity, so please stay tuned. We'll be talking about that a little more during the broadcast. Uh, we've also got some other pre-recorded segments from the team members uh, that we hope you guys enjoy. We've had a little bit of fun with them, so uh, hopefully those are uh, not a drag uh, in the middle of the webinar, but we're trying to get to the point where maybe we could take a little break in the middle, uh, let people go to the bathroom and stuff. So, uh, as always, we continue to work on these webinars, continue to invest in technology uh, and learning new things to hopefully try and bring a better product to you guys uh, and girls out there in the field and uh, really we just hope you enjoy these so without too much more uh, I want to hand it over to Jim Rollins uh, Jim's gonna go ahead and take you guys through Moje micro injectables thanks so much hi my name is Jim Rollins and I work for Moje company tonight I'd like to talk to you about Moje micro injection I want to start off by talking about the advantages of microinjection technology. Then I'd like to talk about the Moje products and how they will fit into your plant healthcare programs. And I'd like to conclude by talking about the microinjection procedure. For those of you who want CEUs or want to take the Moje certification test, please stick around later for the test. I'd like to introduce you to the JJ Moje Company. J.J. Moje first introduced microinjection technology to the arboricultural industry back in 1958. Over the years, we've added a number of products to our product line, including four insecticides, three fungicides, an antibiotic, two micronutrients, and two fertilizer products. With this product line, we can address a lot of your plant health care problems. When it comes to applying chemicals to your trees and landscapes, you have several different alternatives. For many years, the main way of applying chemicals to trees was doing a foliar treatment or a spray. You now have trunk injections, and in some cases, you can inject the products to the soil or do soil drenches in addition to microinjection. I think microinjection brings a lot of advantages to the way in which you apply chemicals to your trees. With microinjection, there's no drift or off-target chemical exposure. I know when I talk to a lot of people in the tree care business, they tell me that it is getting more and more difficult to spray a large tree on a small urban lot. They have a lot of concern about product drifting into adjacent product. With Moje microinjection, you can treat a tree in a small lot with the full confidence that that chemical is not going to drift into adjacent properties. In some cases, you're dealing with trees that are on property where you have water. With microinjection, you can treat that tree in close proximity to water with the confidence that the chemical is going to go in the tree and not in the water. The Moje microinjection system is a closed chemical application system. And by that, we mean the chemical is in the feeder tube, the capsule, or the tree. The benefit to that is that you, as the applicator, your exposure to the chemical is greatly reduced when compared to some of the other ways that you apply chemicals to trees. Microinjection is a systemic application. The active ingredient is actually inside the tree where it needs to be to address the plant health care problem. With microinjection technology, there's less exposure to the beneficial insects. And I think we all understand the relationship of beneficial insects to harmful insects, and we want to minimize the damage to the beneficial insects. 
microinjection is a very targeted, efficient chemical application. Very close to 100% of the chemical goes directly into the tree where it is needed. With some of the other methods of applying chemicals to trees, you have to over apply the amount of chemical that you really need to compensate for the fact that some of that chemical is going to drip off the tree, it's going to drift, or go other places. With microinjection, it's a targeted approach and it all goes directly to the tree. The Moje microinjection system is a passive, low pressure microinjection system. Some of the other systems operate on a very high pressure, which can cause some problems with, for the tree. In some cases, they can separate the bark from the tree, or in other cases, they may actually split the bark in the tree. Because if it's a low pressure system, the Moje system will not do that. There are no rain fast or wash off concerns with microinjection technology. If it rains immediately after you've done your treatments, that's not going to cause a problem. With some of the other application techniques, if it rains immediately after you do the application, you lose a lot of your control. With the Moje system, there's no expensive technical equipment requirements. I know oftentimes when you add a new service to the services you're offering your clients, you have to invest money in equipment. Sometimes it's technical. Sometimes you have to have a dedicated truck or a dedicated trailer. With Moje microinjection, that's not an issue. With Moje microinjection, it is a profitable service for you to provide your customers. I talked to a lot of people in the tree care business and the lawn care business, and one of their frustrations is that it's a very competitive business. And oftentimes they find it difficult to get a reasonable markup for their services. I think you'll find with microinjection technology, it is somewhat specialized and you won't have the intense competition, so you can get a reasonable markup for your services. And last of all, microinjection is a very efficient way to apply chemicals to your trees and it will give you consistent results. You can use it with confidence that it's going to provide the type of control that you want. Microinjection is a logical choice for environmentally sensitive areas. This includes schools and universities, parks and playgrounds, amusement parks, street trees, near water, zoos, and other places that might be considered environmentally sensitive. In understanding microinjection technology, I think it's important that you understand basic tree physiology. When it comes to microinjection and tree physiology, the part of the tree that we're most concerned about is the xylem of the tree. The xylem is the conductive tissue in the tree. The xylem transports water and dissolved minerals from the roots throughout the rest of the plant. This is a cross-section of the tree's major tissue regions. From going outside the tree towards the center of the tree, you first have the outer bark. Then under that you have the inner bark, which is a soft, woody part of the tree. Then you have the phloem, the cambium, and the xylem. Xylem is, is, the, is the area that we want to do our injection. And in our deciduous trees, it's the outer three growth rings. It is usually somewhere in the neighborhood of a quarter to maybe as deep as three quarters of an inch in the tree. Throughout my presentation today, I have inserted some of the questions that you might encounter when you talk about microinjection with your clients. One question you might get is, does drilling damage my tree? And the answer to that is, drilling does cause some short-term damage to your tree. The analogy that I like to use, it's not unlike doing a proper pruning job. The long-term benefits far, far outweigh the short-term damage that you do to the tree. I would like to call your attention to this picture. This is an ornamental pear tree. It had been treated each year for approximately 10 years. Eventually, the tree outgrew the landscape and it was cut down. It was cut down about an inch and a half to two inches above the soil surface, 
which is about the same area that we were injecting the chemicals. I want to call your attention to the compartmentalization of the wounds. You see the red arrow is pointing to a light colored spot in this tree. That is actually where the injection was done two, three, four years ago. I want to call your attention to something else you see. There's no cavities in this tree and there's no decay in this tree. So when you look at this tree, I don't see anything that concerns me in terms of long-term damage that was caused by the tree, to the tree by the injection. I would now like to talk for a little bit about microinjection nutrients into trees. One of the questions I get often is, well, why do I need to microinject nutrients into my trees? You know, I spray, I, I, have soil, I have soil injections done around my tree every couple of years. Doesn't that work? Or in some cases, they say, you know, I spread granular fertilizer around my tree. Doesn't that work? Both of those can be acceptable ways to apply fertilizer to your tree. I think microinjection has a few advantages as in some areas. Sometimes you're dealing with a restricted access to the root system. Maybe you've got a tree that's growing in cl close proximity to a sidewalk and a street, and you really don't have much access to the trees. Microinjection would make sense in that circumstance. Sometimes you're dealing with weak, stressed trees. Maybe they have insect damage, disease damage, or maybe they're suffering from some drought damage and you need to get some nutrients into that tree to help with the recovery process. Microinjection is the fastest way to get nutrients into that tree. Sometimes you may be dealing with a tree that has a damaged root system. If a tree has a damaged root system, if you can bypass those roots and inject directly into the tree, you can help that tree begin with the recovery process. Sometimes you may be dealing with what I call nutrient competition. You have a tree out in your yard and you have a, a very thick sod completely underneath the canopy of the tree. Or maybe you have a garden under the tree and you have a lot of other plants underneath the tree. These plants underneath the tree might be competing with the tree for the nutrients. When you inject the chemical directly into the tree, you know that it is getting the benefit of that fertilizer and that fertilizer isn't going to the other plants underneath that tree. Sometimes you have a tree and you have water contamination concerns. You want to make sure that your fertilizer goes into the tree and not into the water. Microinjection makes sense when you have trees where you're concerned about water contamination. Microinjecting nutrients into a tree makes sense whenever a rapid availability of nutrients are needed. The tree on the left is an example of a tree with restricted roots. You can see this is a parking lot tree in a very, very small island. You really don't have access to a lot of the roots, so making a microinjection into that tree makes sense. The tree on the right is near water. Probably the only way that you can apply fertilizer to that tree with the confidence that none of it is going to go into that water would be a microinjection. Moje makes two fertilizer products. Our first product is Stemex Plus. Stemex Plus is a, a fertilizer that has nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium along with micronutrients in it. Stemex Plus is your complete general use fertilizer. We generally use Stemex Plus on trees that are under stress. You know, when you're on your client's property and you notice that their tree has some leaves, maybe they're off color. They don't have the dark, deep green color they should. It could possibly benefit from Stemex Plus. Sometimes those leaves might be smaller than they should be. Sometimes you may look at the canopy of the tree and you see that it's not as thick or full as it should be. All these trees are under stress and could benefit from an injection of, my, of Moje Stemex Plus. Moje also makes a product, Vigor 53. Vigor 53 is a fertilizer, and the analysis is a 0 28 25. And as you are aware, that 0 indicates the amount of nitrogen 
in that fertilizer. Vigor 53 does not have any nitrogen in it. Why would you use a fertilizer with no nitrogen? Well, there's several situations where I think it makes sense. Sometimes you're dealing with that tree with, a, with root damage recovery, and you want to help the tree generate new roots, but you don't necessarily want to add a lot of nitrogen that might increase the above ground vegetative growth because you don't have the roots to support it. That would be one application of Vigor 53. Sometimes you're dealing with a tree where you have some concerns about Phytophthora root rot. We know that when you're treating trees that have Phytophthora root rot, it's probably a good idea to minimize the amount of nitrogen in that environment. The nitrogen can actually make that tree a little more susceptible to the Phytophthora root rot. Vigor 53 makes sense when you're dealing with trees in an established landscape. Sometimes your client has trees and they say, I like the size and I like the scale of the trees in my landscape. I want to keep them healthy and I really don't want to push a whole lot of vegetative growth. So Vigor 53 would make sense in an established landscape application. How often will I need to inject fertilizer? Fertilizer and micronutrient injections will both be effective for an average of about three years, depending on the availability of nutrients in the soil. It's not something you generally need to do every single year. Moje makes two micronutrient products. Our first one is Injectamin with iron and zinc. We use Injectamin with iron and zinc for trees that have an iron or zinc deficiency. Probably the most common trees that have an iron zinc deficiency are pin oaks and birch trees. Moje also makes Injectamin with manganese, and we use that for trees that have a manganese deficiency. And probably the primary trees that show manganese deficiency are red maples and sweet gum trees. Oftentimes, when a tree has a micronutrient deficiency, it shows up as what we call chlorosis. Chlorosis is, is when the tree's leaves are very light green or yellow in color. And when you look very close at the veins, it may be dark green in the immediate venal area. These are two, two red maple trees that were street trees, and they both showed signs of chlorosis. One of the trees was treated, one of the trees was not. And these are leaves from those two trees. You see the tree on the left was untreated, and it still has the very, very light green leaves. The tree on the right was treated a year ago, and you can see that it has very dark green healthy leaves. When should micronutrients be injected into a tree? Micronutrients may be injected into the tree whenever the tree is actively transpiring. It can't be in its winter dormancy. In the spring, a micronutrient injection, leaf color response will generally appear in a few weeks. In the summer or fall, that micronutrient injection, the leaf color response may not appear until the following spring. So I always recommend when you're going to treat that tree in the summer or fall, it's probably a good idea to tell your client, don't expect to see this tree green up until next spring. One of the questions I get is people say, why not apply micronutrients directly to the soil? You know, why not take some kind of a liquid or some type of a granular application and just spread it underneath the canopy of the tree? Well, actually, there may be a sufficient quantity of micronutrients in the soil, but they're insoluble and they're unavailable for plant uptake, and this is due to a high soil pH. We find that oftentimes when the pH gets 7.5 or up to 8, a lot of times some of the micronutrients like iron, zinc, and manganese are insoluble and the tree can't benefit from it. So the micronutrient deficiency is in the tree, it's not actually in the soil. Okay, now we're going to take a little break, but please stick around, we'll be back in a few minutes.
I love everything about it. I mean, from the guys I work with to like everything I'm learning. The arborist community is second to none worldwide. Anyone that works in other industries and tries and sees what the arborist community is about always flocks to the arborist community. If I meet somebody and they say they climb trees, I'm like, hey, you're my you're my people. It makes social settings very comfortable because we all share the same thing in that our successes and our failures those are all something that we a lot of us in some ways share similar experiences. They've also realize how much it takes to be an arborist and so for the most part are very supportive of other people doing it and are down to help and share and there's a real I mean people really care about each other. Just helping everybody come about in their career and life. I'm Carson with treestuff.com and I'd like to ask you to take a second to learn about the Fallen Families Fund. It's a charity created to provide small cash donations to families who have been affected by the death or injury of a working arborist. All of the administrative costs are covered by Cheryl Inc., so 100% of your contribution goes to help families in their time of healing and recovery. You can learn more and donate at www.fallenfamiliesfund.org. Hey, Jim Carson here from treestuff.com, and I do have a couple questions from uh, people on Facebook. Um, if you have more questions for Jim, you can always just throw them down in the comments section. Uh, Jake and I are here, we're reading those, we're responding to you, and uh, we're taking some opportunities to throw those to Jim for Q&A. Um, a couple from Sean Smith, I want to say, hey, Sean, and thanks for joining us again. Um, this is not the first PHC webinar I've seen you at. Um, Sean asks, can any of these micro-injections be used in conjunction with tree growth regulators and new plantings? Yes, you can, use, you can use most of these injections when you're using other products such as plant growth regulators and also in new plantings. He's got one more question. Uh, we'll call it a question. Um, he says that his biggest issue with Moget's system is um, the speed of uptake with low pressure. And he says that you can't leave the injectors sitting after you start it and you can't pull them out until after the chemical has been taken up by the tree. Um, is there any way around that? Any advice you would give him um, as to how to address that, that slow uptake? That's a great question. And I would like to address that a little bit later on. I'm gonna be talking about the factors that affect the speed of uptake. And uh, I think I'll address some of your concerns when we hit that a little bit later on. Awesome. Joe Wayne McDowell um, asks, is there a special license needed to do Moje injections? Is there a special license to do Moje microinjection? In most states, there is. When you're doing microinjection for your clients, most states you have to have an applicator a permit to do that. It does vary a little bit from state to state, but before you do this, you really need to check with your state and find out what your regulations are. But most states do require it. And what's the best place to find that information? Probably you want to call your, your extension service and find out what you need to apply uh, plants to lawn, landscape, and trees. Most places you will need to have a pesticide applicator license. Um, the other, one of the other big uh, plant healthcare chemical companies that obviously Tree Stuff sells and that's popular on the market is Arborjet. Um, what would be... Uh, Athena Odell asks, what makes Moje more beneficial than ArborJet? And I know that, that you, you talked about a lot of ways that injections are better than other applications, but why is Moje better in certain circumstances? Moje is a little different than ArborJet, and the main way in which they're different is that the Moje system with the capsules is a low pressure microinjection system. So we don't have some of the concerns with high pressure that you get with some of the other systems, such as bark separation or bark splitting. With Moje microinjection, you don't have to invest money in equipment, uh, and, and you don't have to have the technical equipment. And those are the major advantages, and both companies do have some minor differences in their product lines as well. And we're going to talk about the products here very quickly. Um, one more for you, and then I'll let you get back into your, uh, your presentation. Um, Sean Webb asks, can micronutrients and fertilizer be, in, be applied in conjunction with each other? Can microinjection nutrients and fertilizers be injected at the same time? 
yes, uh, you can if you want to, but I think in many cases that's not necessary. I know, for example, the STEMX Plus has nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, but it also has a lot of micronutrients. So although that could be done, I think in most cases you can probably get what you want with the STEMX Plus. Awesome. Well, um, if anybody else has questions, put them in the comments. Um, we may not get to them immediately, but we will have some more Q&A here later in the webinar. And I'm going to throw it back to Jim and let him keep going. Okay, I would now like to talk about insect control with Moje microinjection. Moje actually makes four insecticides, abicide 2, dinocide, emicide, and injecticide B. I would like to compare those four insecticides to help explain where they might fit in a plant health care program. And the way that I did that was I prepared a simple spreadsheet. I've got the products, I've got the insect control, the benefits uh, that each one provides. I've got the knockdown, which is how many days following application till you begin controlling the insect. I compare the residual, how long the product will control insects. And then I describe what kind of a program it is best suited for, whether a preventative option, which would mean applying the chemical before the insects are present, or the curative option, meaning you apply the chemical once the chemicals, I mean, once the insects are in the tree. I'd like to start off by talking about abicide 2, abamectin. As far as insect control, abicide 2 provides a broad spectrum of insect control. Abicide 2 is particularly effective on your Lepidoptera, which are your worm caterpillar type insects. Abicide 2 is also effective controlling mites. Abicide 2 does not fall in the neonicotinoid family of chemicals. In terms of knockdown and residual, Abicide 2 will begin controlling insects about seven days following application. It'll provide season-long control around four months worth of residual. Abicide 2 fits best in a preventative insect control program before the insects are present. The next product is Dinocide. Dinotefuron is the active ingredient in Dinocide. Dinocide is a broad spectrum insect control product. And the main reason we have this product in our product line is because it does a very good job on insect scale, both the soft shell scale as well as the armored scale. Dinocide will provide knockdown approximately three days following application. And Dinocide will provide season-long control somewhere in the neighborhood of three to four months following application. Dinocide can fit in either a preventative program or an early curative program soon after the insects have appeared. Emicide. The active ingredient in emicide is imidacloprid. It is a broad spectrum insecticide. Emicide is not particularly strong on your Lepidoptera or your mites, but it does a very good job on many other insects. Emicide will provide insect knockdown approximately seven days following injection, and it'll provide season-long control four months. Emicide fits best as a preventative option in an insect control program. Our last product is Injecticide B. The active ingredient in Injecticide B is Bidrin. Injecticide B provides a very, very broad spectrum control of insects. It has a very quick knockdown in a matter of hours following injection. It has a relatively short residual compared to the other products. Injecticide B will control insects for about 30 to 60 days following injection. Injecticide B fits best as a curative option in an insect control program. Abicide 2. Some of the insects you can expect to control with Abicide 2 would be clear wing moth borers, leaf miners, your Lepidoptera larvae, mites, plant bugs, scoliated bark beetles, thrips, 
white flies, and many other insects. You heard me say earlier that microinjection makes sense in environmentally sensitive areas. I would like to show you this picture. This is a picture that one of our good applicators up in northeastern Ohio took. They were actually at SeaWorld of Ohio and they were dealing with an insect problem in the trees in the Eagle Point exhibit. This being an amusement park and an, an exhibit involving eagles, they were very concerned about the safety of any type of a treatment that was going to be done in this area. In this particular case, they treated the trees with abicide 2, and they did a very effective job of eliminating the insects in that exhibit. They did not have to relocate the eagles. They didn't have to shut the, the exhibit down, and they had a very, very minimum disruption to anything that was happening at the amusement park. Dinocide. Some of the insects you can expect to control with dinocide include adelgids, armored scale, flat-headed boar, leaf miners, mealybugs, soft-shell scale, spotted lanternfly, white flies, and many other insects. I would like to spend a few minutes now talking about the spotted lanternfly. In this slide, I have a picture of some of the different life stages of the spotted lanternfly. In the upper left-hand corner, you see an egg mass from the spotted lanternfly. There's approximately 30 eggs in this egg mass, and it is protected by a waxy coat that will protect it over the winter months. In the upper right-hand corner is a fourth instar nymph of the spotted lanternfly. The spotted lanternfly goes through four nymph stages. The first stage, they're very small, dark insects, and some people actually mistake them for a tick. In each instar, they get a little bit bigger, and by the time they get to the fourth instar, they actually have the white dots and the orange coloring on them. Immediately below that is the adult spotted lanternfly with the wings closed. To the left of that, in the bottom left-hand corner, is the adult spotted lanternfly with the wings open. This insect has a wingspan of about an inch and a half and a body length of about an inch. Some people that see that insect might mistake it for a small butterfly or perhaps a moth. The spotted lanternfly is actually a large leafhopper. It has piercing mouth parts and it feeds on the sap from many different trees and it produces a heavy amount of honeydew that it excretes and sometimes that turns into the black sooty mold that you're probably familiar with. The spotted lanternfly causes stress to the affected trees and it's possible that the spotted lanternfly is a disease vector and spreads disease from one tree to another. The spotted lanternfly is actually an invasive species originally from China, India, and Vietnam. It is highly attracted to the Atlantis Altissima, also known as the Tree of Heaven. It is a threat to both ornamental as well as agricultural crops. This is a map of where the spotted lanternfly is currently located in the United States. This map was put together in February of 2019. The dark blue section of this map shows where there is a quarantine and there is an infestation of the spotted lanternfly. As you can see, it is currently located in southeastern Pennsylvania. It picks up a few counties in northwestern New Jersey. It picks up a northern county in Delaware, and it picks up a county in northern Virginia. The yellow areas are areas where they found a spotted lanternfly but they don't believe that it is infestation. And you can see those are scattered throughout many areas in New York and the Mid-Atlantic states. I predict next year, if we look at this same map, you're going to see a lot more blue areas and a lot more yellow areas. The host range for the spotted lanternfly. Over 70 different plant species, including the Tree of Heaven, which it is its number one preferred host, black walnut, silver and red maple, butternut, river birch, willow, oak, 
tulip tree, china berry, and oriental bittersweet. Although these are not the only trees that a spotted lanternfly will attack. I would like to share with you some of the research that has been done on the spotted lanternfly. And this is actually some research that was done by Dr. Phil Lewis of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And what he did was he treated Tree of Heaven trees with various chemical treatments, and then he kept track of the insects that he found dead under the canopy of those trees at intervals throughout the summer months. The higher the number on this chart means the more insects were controlled. So the higher number means the more effective the insect control program. When you look at this chart, the red line indicates a bark spray of dinotefuron. The blue line indicates a trunk injection of imidacloprid. The gray line on the bottom are the control trees that did not receive any treatment. The green line indicates a trunk injection of dinocide, and the brown line is a trunk injection of imamectin benzoate. As you can see from this chart, in the first half of the summer, the green line, that is the dinocide, was killing more insects than the other products. And then as you get to later in the summer, uh, it seems like there's several products that are continuing to give good control. This is a 2018 study. It's the same test. And again, you see the green line, the dino side line, uh, is killing more insects throughout the entire season. So it provided better control. Some of the research conclusions of this study are that dinotefuron applied as a trunk injection was superior to the other treatments. The adult spotted lanternfly are susceptible to dinotefuron and imidacloprid. A combination of safari, which would be dinotefuron, plus merit, which would be imidacloprid, did not increase the mortality of the insects. Imamectin benzoate was not effective against the spotted lanternfly. This is Moget's spotted lanternfly recommendation. We recommend injecting dinocide as a trunk injection. We recommend injecting in early to mid-July. This would coincide with the third or fourth instar of the nymph. And this would generally be when most trees have already bloomed. This will provide spotted lanternfly control during the breeding and egg-laying season until cold weather hits. That is the critical time to control this insect. Okay, I'd like to talk about emicide now and some of the insects you could expect to control with emicide. Aphids, citrus longhorn beetle, emerald ash boar, flat-headed boars, palm weevil, psyllids, included the lerp psyllid, royal palm bugs, thrips, white fly, and many other insects. And last of all, Injecticide B. Injecticide B will control aphids, boars, caterpillars, emerald ash boar, gypsy moth, insect scale, leaf miner, and many more insects. I would now like to spend a few minutes talking about disease control with microinjection. Moje has four disease control products, Arborfos, Fungisol, Tebujet 16, and Microject Ultra. Arborfos is a phosphite-based fungicide. It has a caution statement on the label, and Arborfos may be used for ornamental, forest, nut, and fruit trees. So Arborfos may be used on trees in which somebody's going to consume the fruit in the fall. It's the only product in our disease control and insect control product where you can use it on trees where you're going to eat the fruit in the fall. These are some of the diseases you can expect to control with an Arborfos injection. Anthracnose, apple scab, armillaria root rot, fire blight, 
Phytophthora root rot, and others. Fungisol. Debacarb is the active ingredient of fungisol. It carries a caution statement on its label. Fungisol is a very broad spectrum systemic fungicide and it prevents the infection of many vascular and canker diseases in trees. Some of the diseases you can expect to control with fungisol would include anthracnose, cytospora canker, diplodia tip blight, fusarium wilt, nectria canker, oak decline, fomopsis canker, and many more. Tebujet 16. Tebuconazole is the active ingredient in Tebujet 16. It carries a caution label, and you can use it for the seasonal suppression of many diseases, including apple scab, oak wilt, Dutch elm disease, anthracnose, hawthorn leaf spot, and many more. Our last disease control product is Mycoject Ultra. The active ingredient in Mycoject Ultra is oxytetracycline hydrochloride. Mycoject Ultra carries a caution signal on its label. And Mycoject Ultra is actually an antibiotic. It provides suppression of bacterial diseases. Mycoject Ultra actually has a limited shelf life. It's the only product in the Moje product line that falls in that category. We recommend that you use Mycoject Ultra the year in which it was produced. Some of the diseases that you can expect to control with Mycoject Ultra include ash yellows, bacterial leaf scorch on elm, oak, oleander, and sycamore, fire blight, palm lethal yellows, and other bacterial diseases. Moje also makes two combination products. These are products in which the fungicide and the insecticide are combined in the same capsule. Sometimes when you're treating a client's tree, they have both an insect and a disease in the tree at the same time. We make Abisol, which includes abicide plus fungisol. We also make imisol, which includes imicide plus fungisol. That wraps up my part about the Moje products, and now we're going to take a short break, but please stay tuned. It has completely changed the way I operate. Like, my life has improved significantly. It gave me a direction to go in. Every day is a challenge, and every day just keeps building me up and up. It's great. I love it. I get to touch living, beautiful trees every day. I work outside. It got me away from a lot of uh, bad extracurricular activities, you know, and helped me mature in life. Not only did it give me my ethics and work, it taught me to appreciate the finer things uh, that are out there in nature and you know everything I have in life actually started somehow with tree care including meeting my wife. Hi I'm Cale Royer, head party animal at treestuff.com. I'm here to make sure that everyone knows about our tree stuff party program. Each month, volunteer arborists from different regions host free recreational climbing events powered by treestuff.com, giving local arborists a chance to meet, hang out, climb, and try out some cool new gear in the trees. Every Tree Stuff party is 100% free, so there's no reason to not bring your family, friends, coworkers, and acquaintances. Check our Facebook events page to learn about upcoming Tree Stuff parties, and sign up to be notified when there's a new Tree Stuff party in your neck of the woods at treestuff.com parties. It's all about seeing friends, making new friends, and having fun in the trees. I hope you can make it to a party soon. Have you heard about trio caching? Like geocaching, it's a real world hunt using GPS coordinates to find the trio cache plaque. 
Share your adventure on social media and you can win some sweet prizes. See who else has visited the cache in the digital logbook and have a blast. There are more than 85 amazing Trio Cache locations in 15 different countries to satisfy your thirst for adventure. Head to treestuff.com slash cache to get started, then grab your gear, find the tree, climb it, and claim victory. All right, Jim, I do have a few more questions for you. Um, and again, if anybody has more questions for Jim, go ahead and throw them in the chat. Um, I'll either hit them now or uh, we'll have another opportunity for some Q&A later on in the, in the, uh, the show. Um, getting right to it, we had some very specific questions about what some of your products do and do not treat. Um, you had a big old list of insects there that uh, your chemicals can, can treat. Um, Cord LaCroix asks, what they can use for the bark beetle infestation in California? For the bark beetle infestation in California, we have been using our Abicide 2 product. And it's working well? It, it has been working well. We rec we're injecting a little higher rates than we did with the capsules. And generally what we're using is we're using one of the other injection devices and going a little bit higher rate. But yes, we are getting good control with the Abicide 2 at the higher rates. And if they don't have uh, access to those other devices, could they just use more capsules? If they wanted to use more capsules, that would be a possibility. They could piggyback a couple of them if they wanted to go that route, yes. Um, what would you recommend, this is coming from Jeff Cowell, for bronze birch borers? Bronze birch borer. I would recommend an injection of emicide for the bronze birch borer. And probably the best time to do that, depending where you're located is probably sometime during the month of May, right about now. Perfect timing, right? Perfect timing, yes. Um, uh, Sean Smith, and again, I, I've looked over your quiz, so I think I know that you're getting there, but um, he mentions that he hasn't had good luck treating pines specifically um, because of the, the low pressure of the injectable. Um, should we just, should we wait until you get a little further on in your presentation or you have um, some solution for, for injecting pines? Yeah, I would, I would comment on that now. When you're dealing with pines and some of the other conifers, they can be a little bit uh, trickier to inject and sometimes your uptake will be a little bit slower with your conifer trees. And this is because of a couple of reasons. Number one, the vascular system is a little bit different. And when you inject a conifer tree or a pine, we recommend going a little bit deeper in those trees. In a deciduous tree, we like to pick up the outer three growth rings. When you get into a conifer, we like to pick up the outer seven to 10 growth rings. So you probably wanna go about three quarters of an inch when you're injecting into most conifer trees. The other thing that you have to be a little bit careful of when you're injecting a conifer is the resin flow, the sap. And when you're injecting any of the conifers that have sap, it's very important that you get that feeder tube in that hole just as soon as that drill bit comes out of that hole so that you don't give it an opportunity to backfill uh, with, with the sap or the resin. And a lot of times in pines, what we recommend, and if you're doing a spring injection, wait until you see at least a half of an inch or maybe an inch of new growth. That would indicate that the tree has fully emerged from its winter dormancy and it's actively transpiring. This question, didn't come directly from uh, uh, somebody watching, but I just kind of wanted to clarify. You did mention Moget's recommended treatment for spotted lanternfly. Um, is that something that you would recommend doing as a preventative if you're in that New Jersey, Pennsylvania area? If you're in an area and you're in very close proximity to spotted lanternfly, yes, you could do that as a preventative. We know that the spotted lanternfly uh, probably has a capability of traveling quite a ways. And if you're maybe adjacent to some of those counties where you do know that it has, is established, yes, you could do, you could do a, uh, a preventative injection. I've got one here from Sean Webb, and um, this is one of them that is a little bit over my head, but you're the professional. Um, he, says, he asks, many of the bark or foliar spray insecticides are contact controls. 
Um, do injectable insecticides require the target insects to actively feed? The insects that you inject into a tree do require that the insect feed. I think you look at all the in insects that we talked about, most all of them, they're either feeding on the foliage or they're sucking the sap out of the tree. So yes, these do not function as contact insecticides. Um, Jana Owens is asking specifically about using micro mycojet with um, oleander leaf scorch. And um, she's curious how effective that is and especially how quickly does that work? We've done work with Microject Ultra and Leaf Scorch, and what it does is it suppresses the symptoms, and it has been effective. Um, what we generally recommend is, is, a, is a treatment in the spring months, and that'll give you about one year's worth of control of suppression of that particular disease. Uh, we've had done work with it, and it's been quite effective. It is something you have to do on a yearly basis. Awesome. I, well, I hope that's helpful, Jana. Um, and again, if you have more questions, please feel free to throw them in the chat. That's part of what Jim's here for, and clearly he's killing it so far. So um, maybe, we, maybe we try and stump him. I don't know. Uh, hit us with whatever you've got. I'm going to let Jim get back to his presentation and teach us a little bit more about Moje injectables. OK, now I'd like to talk about the Moje microinjection procedure. How do you actually do it? First of all, I'd like to comment under a couple of conditions when it is not particularly advisable to inject. We do not recommend injecting during cold weather. It is important that the tree not be in its winter dormancy when you do the injections. We recommend making microinjections when the soil temperatures are 44 degrees or higher. When the temperature is that high, the tree is actively transpiring and you will get much better uptake. We also recommend that you do not inject when you're experiencing extremely low soil moisture. If you want to do microinjection work and your soil looks like the soil in this picture, you really need to have your client water before and after you do your injections. This will do two things. Number one is it'll increase the transpiration rate of the tree so you'll get much better uptake and it'll improve the uptake within the tree and the translocation throughout the entire tree. You heard me say earlier that with Moje microinjection, you do not need to invest a lot of money in expensive and technical equipment. Well, I'd like to talk about the tools that you need to do a Moje microinjection. First of all, you need to have the Moje capsules. Second of all, you need to have a cordless electric drill. And when it comes to an electric drill, I recommend that you buy a good medium price drill. I don't recommend you buy the least expensive, and I don't recommend you go out and buy the most expensive, most powerful. I find sometimes with a real high power drill, sometimes it's so fast and so powerful that it can be difficult to control the depth at which it drills. So just go out and get a good medium price drill. I also recommend that you have a backup battery so that you can drill all day without having to recharge. You also need an 11 64th inch drill bit. That is the, depth, the diameter of drill bit that we use for injecting the capsules. You need to have a tape measure or a diameter tape so that you can measure the diameter or the circumference of the tree. You need to have a small rubber mallet and you need to have your personal protective equipment. Your personal protective equipment includes chemical resistant gloves, eye protection, either, either a shield or goggles. You need to have a long sleeve shirt, long pants, shoes, and socks. Dosage, or number of capsules. You determine the number of capsules that you need to inject in that tree by determining the circumference or the diameter of the tree. <clears throat> the circumference in inches divided by six will indicate the number of capsules you will need. So if the tree has a 30 inch circumference, it would need five capsules. If you think in terms of diameter, you take the diameter in inches 
and divide that by two. So if the tree has a 10 inch diameter, it would need five capsules. Dosage and volume of capsules. You may have noticed on the Moshe product list that we have capsules that come in different volume capsules. In our insecticides, for example, we have a two mil capsule and we would recommend you use that on small trees. That is trees that are two to 10 inches in diameter. We would recommend you use the three mil capsule on medium sized trees. That is trees that are 10 to 36 inches in diameter. And we recommend using the four mil capsule on what we consider to be large trees. That is trees that are 36 inches in diameter or larger. We do not recommend injecting trees with a diameter of less than two inches. Where to inject? We recommend that when you're injecting a tree, you inject on or above the root flares where there is an active sap stream. If you think about it, that root goes into the ground, it branches off, and there's a lot of feeder roots feeding into that root system. So on that root flare or immediately above it, you have a very active sap stream. And you'll have better uptake if you inject in an active sap stream. We recommend that you stay out of the valleys between the buttress roots. And that's because there is a rather slow sap stream in that area. You don't have all those roots pulling moisture, so your uptake is going to be much slower in the valleys between the root buttress. One of the questions I get from time to time is, can the capsules be injected higher up on the tree? You know, sometimes you don't have access to the root flares, and capsules may be injected higher up in the tree. But remember that you're going to have a little bit slower uptake and you're also going to see a little bit slower wound response when you inject up higher on the tree. So now that you've measured the tree and determined how many capsules you need and where you're going to put them, now it's time to pressurize the capsule. When you pressurize the capsule, it puts about eight pounds of pressure in the capsule and it kind of speeds up the injection process a little bit. So what you do is you pick up the capsule and then you push the domed top down and that will pressurize the cap and you'll hear it click a couple of times as you push it down. Many people use their thumbs but you can also use a compression tool to push the top down on the capsules and we do make and sell a compression tool that you can buy to help push those lids down on the capsules. Now you're ready to put the feeder tube into the capsule. We recommend that you push the feeder tube in part way into the capsule and you want to position the V-notch upward. When you position the V-notch upward, the part of the capsule that goes into the tree is oriented so that it properly feeds the product into the sap stream as efficient as possible. Now you're ready to drill your hole. We recommend that you use a clean, sharp, high helix drill bit. A high helix drill bit is actually a woodworker's drill bit and it cuts a nice sharp hole, it doesn't grind a lot. We recommend that you drill through the bark, the phloem, the cambium, and into the active xylem. And that could be anywhere from a quarter of an inch to maybe three quarters of an inch deep, depending upon the thickness of the bark in the tree and depending on whether the tree is a conifer or a deciduous tree. I always recommend that when you pull that drill bit out after drilling a hole, look for light colored xylem on that drill bit. When you see light colored xylem on that drill bit, that indicates that you have actually penetrated the xylem of the tree where you need to be. If you pulled that drill bit out and you saw nothing on that drill bit but dark colored wood, that might indicate that you haven't drilled deep enough and you're still in the bark of the tree. Or that light colored wood could indicate that you've actually drilled into a diseased part of the tree. And neither of those would be good injection situations. When drilling into the tree, what you're going to find is that as you drill through the outer bark and the inner bark, that is very soft wood tissue and your drill bit will go through that very quickly. 
You'll also notice that since it's soft wood, wood tissue, there's not a lot of resistance on that drill bit. Once you hit the xylem, that is generally a harder wood, and you'll notice more resistance on your drill bit, and you'll notice a little bit of a change in the sound or the pitch of your drill bit because it's working a little bit harder. So when you hit the xylem, then you know you're pretty close to where you need to be, and you want to be in the outer three growth rings in the case of a deciduous tree, or the outer seven to ten in the case of a conifer. How often should I change your drill bits? Over a period of time, your drill bits will get dull and they won't drill as well. I recommend looking for a sawdust pigtail, indicating the wood was cut with a sharp drill bit. If you didn't see this pigtail and you just saw sawdust, that could indicate that the drill bit has gotten rather dull and it's grinding the wood instead of cutting it and it would be time to replace it. Moje puts a drill bit in every case of product, every 288 capsules. So maybe when you've drilled about 300 holes, maybe it's time to replace that drill bit. One question I get is, well, what if the drill depth is off a little bit? And I recommend that if the drill bit is a little, it's better that the drill bit be a little bit too deep than be a little bit too shallow. And the reason for that is, I think if it's a little bit too deep, that extra depth will serve as a short-term reservoir until the tree takes the product up. Sometimes if you're too shallow, the end of the feeder tube can hit the end of the hole, preventing you from getting a good seal, and some of the product might leak out of the hole. Now that you've drilled the hole, put the feeder tube with the capsule in the hole, take your rubber mallet and strike the rectangular strike area on the back of the capsule. When you strike the capsule, you're trying to accomplish two things. Number one, it breaks the capsule membrane, which releases the chemical into the feeder tube. Also, when you strike the capsule, it sets the feeder tube into the hole that you have just drilled. So once you've done stri stricken the capsule, I suggest that you look and make sure that there is product in the feeder tube, and also make sure that you don't have chemical running out of the hole. I recommend that you work your way around the tree. And by that I mean drill the hole and then immediately put a capsule in the hole. Then drill a hole and put a capsule in the, ho in the hole. Some people will attempt to drill all the holes and then come back later and fill the capsules. I don't recommend that for two reasons. Number one, when you put the capsule and the feeder tube in the hole immediately after you drill it, there's less sap flow interruption. So I think you'll get a better uptake. Also, any time that you save drilling all the holes and coming back later, sometimes you'll lose that time when you have trouble finding that hole. It's easy to lose that hole in a thick bark tree. Then you leave the capsule in the tree until both the capsule and the feeder tube have emptied. This could take anywhere from 10 minutes <clears throat> to as long as several hours. What influences the uptake time? Well, there's a handful of things that will influence how long it takes that capsule to empty. One would be the species of the tree. You know, you have porous trees and you have non-porous trees. Porous trees like, like your, oaks, your oaks and your honey locusts and some of those, you'll find the uptake is a little bit quicker than your non-porous trees. The health of the tree will influence the uptake time. A tree that's under stress will take a little longer for uptake than a tree that is perfectly healthy. Because a tree that's healthy is transpiring faster than that tree that is under stress. Leaf surface of the tree will influence the uptake time. A tree that is fully leafed out is evaporating more water, so the transpiration rate is faster. If you're injecting a tree that's just leafing out, you have a rather limited leaf surface, there's less evaporation, and there will be a slower uptake. Injection technique. I think you'll find that when you first do your injections, it may take a little longer. Once you get experience at it, I think you'll find that the injection time will improve. Time of day. We know that when you do your injections during the morning hours, the injection is faster than if you wait until later on in the day. 
Probably the greatest thing that influences your uptake time are the weather conditions. Temperature. Generally, the warmer the temperature, the faster the injection. The warmer the temperature, the more evaporation, so you have more transpiration. Humidity. The higher the humidity, the slower the injection. When you have a high humidity, it slows the evaporation, which slows the transpiration. So when it's real muggy, it's going to take a little longer for uptake. Air movement. If you have some wind or breeze, the uptake is going to be faster if you have a very calm, still day. Again, that's related to in the evaporation. You have more evaporation in a windy day than you do in a real still day. Sunshine. When you have sunshine, the transpiration rate will be faster, so your uptake will be a little faster. And then last of all, soil moisture. It's important that you have moisture in the soil so that the tree can have moisture to draw up into the tree. So when you have adequate soil moisture, the uptake will be faster than if you have an extremely dry soil. So I hope that answers the question that came a little earlier. Uh, you can see there are a lot of things that can influence the uptake time of a capsule in a tree. Once that capsule has fully emptied, you want to remove that capsule. And the preferred way to do that is with your protective equipment on, grab the capsule with one hand and remove it. Use your other gloved hand to shield yourself just in case there's a few drops of product still left in that capsule. Then you want to put the empty capsules in a heavy duty plastic bag. And you, then you dispose of the bag in accordance with your local regulations. In most areas, the regulations require that you put the capsules in a plastic bag, tie the bag, and you can dispose of it with your regular trash. I recommend that you disinfect your drill bit between trees. You don't want to be transporting disease from a sick tree to a healthy tree. You can disinfect your drill bit by brushing off the sawdust and spraying that drill bit with some type of a disinfectant. It could be Lysol or some generic equivalent. Some people will dip their drill bits into a, a solution of alcohol. Can the same hole be used twice to do two injections? The answer to that is yes. You may inject in the same hole twice, but only if the second injection is immediately after the first injection. In other words, you can't leave that hole unattended for several days and come back and inject it. It will not uptake. What we generally recommend if you need to use the same hole twice, that you do what we call is piggybacking. You inject the first product, and once the capsule has emptied, then you very carefully pull the capsule off the feeder tube, leaving the feeder tube in the tree. And then you put the second capsule on that same feeder tube. Where do I inject the next year? Sometimes you're going to be injecting that tree uh, for several years in a row. When you come back the next year to inject, we recommend that you inject to the left or to the right of the previous year's injection site. We recommend that you do not inject vertically, that is immediately above or immediately below the previous year's injection site. At this point in time, most of my presentation has dealt with Moje and capsules. Moje also puts product in what we call liquid loadable products. This is the same proven Moje chemistry that's in capsules, but it may be injected through most reloadable injection systems. Moje liquid loadable products come in one liter bottles. And at this point in time, Moje has Abicide 2, Arborphos, Dinocide, Emicide, Injectamin, Microject Ultra, Stemex Plus, and Tebujet 16 in the liquid loadable bottles that you can run through many other injection systems. Moje also sells the Chemjet. The Chemjet is a reloadable tree injection system. The ChemJet is easy to use, and the ChemJet has up to a 20 mil capacity. 
So you can inject up to 20 mils per injection site with the ChemJet. With the ChemJet, you used an 11 64th inch injection hole for your injection. That is the same size that you use for a capsule. And the ChemJet operates under a little higher pressure than the Moje capsule. Moje also makes the Smart Shot. It is a reloadable tree injection system. It too is easy to use. Now the Smart Shot comes in two different models. One model is capable of injecting either 3 mil or 6 mil per injection site. The other one is capable of injecting 5 mil or 10 mil per injection site. The Smart Shot requires a 7 64th inch hole. That's a little bit smaller than with the capsules. And the Smart Shot also operates under a little bit higher pressure than the capsules. Cost and pricing. Sometimes I get questions about how to price your Mose microinjection applications. When I talk to applicators, a lot of times they have kind of two different ways that they do it. I find one common way is they will take the cost of the product and they will multiply it by anywhere from three to five times and that is how they will bill their client. You know, if they're on the property providing other services, maybe they'll mark it up three times the cost of the product. If they're making a special trip to the property and only injecting maybe one or two trees, they need to get a little bit more, so maybe they'll mark it up about five times the cost of the product. The other way that I find people will price their products is they'll have just a flat rate. They'll charge somewhere between $10 and $16 per capsule for the fertilizers and micronutrients, and they may charge somewhere between $13 and $22 per capsule for the insecticides or the fungicides. Here's an example of what that would look like in an ash tree with an emicide treatment. If you had an ash tree that had a 20 inch diameter, that would require 10 capsules. The average cost of a capsule of emicide would be about $4.40 per capsule. So in this tree, you'd have about $44 in materials. You could bill your client somewhere in a neighborhood of $132 or maybe $220 for that injection. So that would leave you with about $88 to $176 in gross profit. So that gives you a little idea of how people are pricing their Moje microinjections. Before you do any of your injections, I think it's very important that you have diagnosed the product that you're dealing with. And I get people say, you know, it seems like there's always new things popping up in my area. What's the best way that I can stay in touch with what's happening in my area and how I can accur accurately diagnose the problems? Well, there's several things that I can recommend you do. First and foremost, I would recommend that you subscribe to the University Extension Update newsletters that are available in your area. I know a lot of the agricultural colleges have an extension service that provides a usually weekly email that'll tell you what type of insects or diseases they're finding. It'll talk about weather and a lot of useful information that you can take to the field with you when you're attempting to diagnose problems. Some of you have places where you take your samples for diagnosing. A lot of times the people at those places can tell you what types of things they're seeing out in your geographical area and that can provide you some really good information. I recommend that you go to an arborist or lawn and landscape seminar during the off months. A lot of times part of their programs are dedicated to talking about tree health care problems. A lot of you belong to professional trade shows or, or trade organizations and they put out publications that provide you a lot of information. And last of all, sometimes your local newspaper garden section, usually on Sunday, provides information about what's happening out in the lawn and landscapes in your area. That can be a good source because a lot of times that's where your clients are getting their information. One thing that is new with Moje is recently we updated our Moje.com website and we did this so it would be easier for you to access information from tablets and smartphones. So it's designed that you can better use it when you're out in the field because we know in many cases 
uh, when you're out in the field, you, you, you want to be diagnosing right out there. So I would encourage you to check out our moje.com website and, and see how it can help you with some of the, these problem diagnoses. That wraps up my presentation today. And at this point in time, I would like to ask if there are any other questions out there. We do have some more questions, Jim. Um, give me just a second to pull up my list as I've been pulling them off of, uh, off of the chat. Daryush Pishvai asks, do you have any product that treats, and I hope you know what this is because I don't, uh, Porterford disease? I'm sorry, what was that disease again, please? Porterford? Porterford disease. Boy, I tell you what, I, I can't answer that question. I am not familiar with that particular problem. Well, uh, Dariush, if you're still there in the chat, um, maybe you can clarify, um, help us out with maybe your area or the tree that you're, uh, you're look, seeing issues in, and uh, we'll see if we can jog Jim's memory here. Um, another one that just is me looking for clarification, it wasn't a, a question in the chat, but you said you take the diameter and divide by two or the circumference and divide by six. And yes. that's how many uh, capsules you should use? Yes. Do you round up or round down? That's a good question. Do you round up or you round down? And my answer to that is it's kind of a judgment call. If you're, if you're in an area where you're, you're dealing with heavy insect or heavy disease pressure, I would definitely use the extra capsule, round up. If you're in an area where maybe you're doing your light or moderate, then you could round down. The other thing you can do also is sometimes you look at the canopy of the tree and if the canopy looks like it's a little bit small, maybe you could round down. If the canopy looks like it's really large, it's not competing with other trees, then maybe you could round up. You talk about certain trees or certain treatments that require um, multiple treatments, year, like just the same treatment every year or something like that. Um, Sean Webb says, so hypothetically, could we inject um, trees on one property, oh, I'm looking at the wrong, um, he, Jeff Cowell is who I was looking for, um, continually drilling multiple holes over a few years won't cause long-term damage in the tree? If you drill holes in trees every year, will it cause long-term damage? And my answer to that is if it's done properly, no, it won't. And usually, you know, like in a deciduous tree, we're drilling into the outer three growth rings. And what I recommend is you drill your first hole your first year. The next year you drill to the right or the left of that. The third year you go to the other side of where the original hole was. And by the fourth year, you should have about three years of growth over where the original injection site was. So then that, when you come back that fourth year, you can drill in the same area that you drilled that first year three years ago. So it, it can be done. You've got to be a little careful. You make sure you avoid uh, where you had drilled the previous year or two. My follow-up question to that, um, you mentioned that sometimes even when you're applying, you can lose those holes. How do you, and then you said that you have to apply the following year in a specific orientation to last year's holes. How are you supposed to find last year's holes? Sometimes that can be a challenge, finding last year's hole. And if you can't find last year's hole, then you, you find a good, healthy place to drill in that tree. And be careful, look above and below to make sure you don't see anything indicating a hole and go ahead and inject. But yeah, sometimes, particularly with thick bark trees, it can be a challenge to find the, the hole the following year. Um, so Daryush is still here. Um, hopefully we can answer his question. Keenan Baird chimed in. He says um, he thinks he's probably talking about Port Orford disease, which he calls, let's, I'm going to give this my best shot, Phytophthora lateralis. Phytophthora? Yeah. Okay. Um, all I can say is I know that we use our arborfoss on some types of Phytophthora. I can't comment specifically on that type of Phytophthora, but, but if it's a Phytophthora root rot, I think the Arborfoss product would work on that particular disease. And is that something where there may be more information on the product label itself? Um, 
There's probably not on the product label, but we can certainly look into that, definitely. Um, another one, and this was Sean Webb. I got a little ahead of myself earlier. Hypothetically, could he inject the trees on one property and then go to another property and inject there, come back and remove the capsules just to save downtime? And uh, there was some discussion in the chat about this, and I think, I think we all know what the answer is, but uh, what are your thoughts on that? I his question is what we call leaving the capsule unattended. And I think the answer to that tree, that question is, number one, with injecticide B, you definitely cannot do that. Injecticide B is a toxic product, and you cannot leave the property when you have injecticide B on it. Our other products, I think what you'll find is it's somewhat of a judgment call. I know I've talked to some state people about that. If you're working in a private property and it's a fenced-in yard, in most cases, yes, you can leave that property, come back later, and remove the capsules. If you're putting capsules in street trees across the street from a school at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, no, you wouldn't want to do that. But in many cases, yes, you can leave and come back later on and pick up those capsules. You hit almost exactly what Athena Odell mentioned um, in the chat. They said, what if a kid walks by and pulls out one of your capsules? Um, so I, I understand what you mean, but it's a judgment call. It's yeah. fenced in yard, dogs, kids. Yes. Um, Darius says that we answered his question, and that's what he was looking for. He appreciates it. Um, I've got one more from Jason Dudick. Are there injectables for pine fungus? Pine what? Pine fungus. For pine fungus. The answer to that is true. That depends on the, on the particular problem that he's dealing with. I know we have, uh, our, our products are used in several different diseases in conifer trees. So the answer to the question is yes, it, it, depending on the type of fungus that he's talking about. Awesome. Um, do you have a minute that you can show us exactly how to in, apply one of your injectables? Absolutely. I would be happy to. That'd be awesome. Okay, what I've got here is actually a, a log. It's not quite as good as actually doing a tree, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to inject it with some Stemex Plus. This is the way the Moje products come, come packaged. This is actually a, uh, a quarter flat. This has 24 capsules of Stemex Plus, and it has 24 of the feeder tubes. So here's one of the capsules. And here's one of the feeder tubes. The diameter of this particular tree is about, about 10 inches. So a tree this big would require five capsules. So I'm going to put on my safety glasses. And I'm going to put on my safety gloves. And what I do is, usually once I determine how many capsules it will need, what I do is I get out the capsules, and I usually try to position them around the base of the tree so I plan exactly where I'm going to do my injections. And then what I do is I will work my way around that tree, injecting the capsules. So here I've got my capsule. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert the feeder tube part way. You see I've got the, the V-notch upward. I'm going to pressurize the capsule by pushing it down. You hear those clicks. That'll keep the top locked down. Then I put my feeder tube in part way with the V-notch oriented upward. I want to make sure that I don't pull it, push it in all the way because I don't want to break the membrane. Now I'm ready to drill my hole. I've got my drill with the 11 64th inch high helix drill bit. I usually will drill at a slight downward angle. That way the capsule will drain a little better. And I usually like dr drill in between two, two bark sections. And when I drill, what I do is I like to st start my drill. I go in and I pull it out in, in one motion. You don't want to stick it in there and grind it around. So I'm going to drill my hole. Whoops. Had a little problem with the drill bit on this one. It's a good idea, good idea to make sure your drill bit's in tight. 
in the same hole. I drill my hole and I look and I see good, healthy, white wood tissue on my drill bit. That indicates that I've gone the proper depth. Now I take my capsule and my feeder tube and I will push it part way into the hole. Again, making sure that the top is, the V notch is oriented upward. Then I take my rubber mallet. This is a, a relatively small hammer. It's about an ounce or two. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tap it right on this rectangular strike area. And I'm going to tap it. And then I look to make sure that there is chemical in the feeder tube. I look here and I make sure that there is no chemical running out of the hole, indicating that it has been set properly. And I don't see any chemical running out. I do see chemical in the feeder tube, and you can see the product is being pushed into the tree right here. So that is the microinjection procedure. And then I just work my way around the tree doing it that way. Awesome and pretty simple and straightforward. Um, yes. One question as you're doing this, Athena Odell asks, um, and basically it boils down to, can you accidentally break that membrane? Is it, are you really at a threat of when you first put it in of, of accidentally breaking that membrane? Can you actually break the membrane when you push the feeder tube in part way? Usually not. That, that, that membrane is pretty tight and, and usually, it does, usually it doesn't happen, no. So, um, because they're asking why you're setting the, putting the tube in the capsule first and not the tube into the tree first. That is a great question, and quite frankly, you could do it either way. I mean, if you wanted to, you could drill your hole, put your tube in, put your pressurized cap on and tap it. Either way would be perfectly acceptable. Um, I'm going to give people just a couple minutes just to throw some more questions into the chat. When I mention something that we have going on in the office, um, so I'm going to let Jim off the hook for this one because uh, Many of you know Nick Bonner, who's my boss, and he's the one who was like the brainchild behind launching the Tree Stuff webinars. Um, we're trying to get, we're, we've been expanding the webinar series a lot, and uh, Nick has put himself on the line, and he says that if we can hit 500 concurrent viewers on one of our webinars in 2019, Nick will dye his hair platinum blonde and film a uh, product review video. Um, so as we, I, I know we haven't hit it this time, but as we continue make, doing more and more webinars in 2019, share, tell your friends, tell them that this is the place for live arborist training, and uh, see if we can't make Nick make a fool of himself on recorded video. Um, and thankfully, that did give us a little bit more time um, for a two couple more questions. Um, Jason Dudick, one more time, he missed it. What's the required PPE for application? I'm sorry, what is the required? PPE. Personal equipment? Personal protective equipment when we inject Moje products includes some type of protective eyewear. It could be goggles or it could be a face shield. You need to have some type of chemical resistant gloves. You need to have a long sleeve shirt long pants, shoes, and socks. Um, I think I've got one more, and this is a question for you. I'm not going to touch this one. Matt Derrickson wants to know if he can buy that 23 pack for a discount. <laughs> I, As he laughs at you, Matt Derrickson. I, I don't know. That's, that's something I'll have to think about. <laughs> And uh, how can we contact you if you have questions about, um, about Moje products or where to get them or diseases? Yes, actually, actually if you go on the, web, the moje.com website that has my contact information and you're more than welcome to contact me if you have any, any questions. Okay, that concludes our presentation tonight. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you very much, Jim. That was a great webinar. We really appreciate uh, Moje sending you out here and you taking the time to go through uh, all this IDPM stuff and micro injections with our customers and the audience. Uh, definitely a lot of learning lessons. Um, 
want to, as always, thank the crew, Jake Miller, for setting all these webinars up, doing the logistics, Carson and Kale. Uh, they're the tech guys behind this. They're the ones that bring the magic of picture and audio to the internet for us uh, and allow us to continue doing this stuff. So a uh, huge thanks to the whole team for that. Um, we have so much exciting stuff coming up. We've got uh, the Arborist Discount Network, which we alluded to earlier, I think, in a spot, and uh, we may have something coming up at the end here for. Uh, but we also have in our next webinar, which is next week, um, we're going to be doing a special segment called Tree Stuff After Dark. Uh, I can't tell you much about it right now, but I can tell you it won't be educational um, and it'll probably be pretty hilarious. So uh, there's going to be some really fun opportunities for you, the audience, to mess with us, uh, the people um, behind the camera and in front of the camera in some cases. So uh, we really hope you guys will join that. It should be a really fun and interactive kind of wacky thing, um, but it'll be after the webinar at the very end, last 10 minutes or so. Um, and like I said, it won't be educational. So. I uh, really hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, I do want to toss it back to Jake for one final message. I really like the, uh, the color. It's nice to be able to scale it. Biggest discounts ever. One hour only. Arborist Discount Network. On May 30th from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, TreeStuff.com is hosting a one-night only special event on our Facebook page. The Arborist Discount Network will feature epic savings on brand name items you won't find anywhere else. Teufelberger, Petzl, Singing Tree, Notch, and more. To see the deals and get the inside scoop, go to Facebook.com forward slash TreeStuff.com at 8 on Thursday, May 30th. Yes, this is awesome.